So my name is John Haber. Um, as Scott said, I, I manage the, the, uh, the funds, our funds. I've uh, been a uh, member of QCA since 2001 and uh, have uh, done quite a bit of uh, investing with the group. Um, done a little bit of investing before I joined the group. And um, a lot of the things that Tony was saying about uh, the value of the organized group, uh, I, I can attest to because um, as I look back on some of the deals I did before I, I, I knew what I was doing, um, some, some pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly uh, the deals that I wouldn't do today. So I uh, learned quite a lot through the years. Um, I'll let these guys introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Good morning. Uh, Dan Fleming with River Cities Capital Funds. We are a uh, venture capital and growth equity investment firm based here in Cincinnati with another office in Raleigh, North Carolina. We con concentrate our investments these days in uh, IT and healthcare. Uh, on the IT side, it's mostly uh, business to business, software as a service, or technology enabled business services. On healthcare, we're not doing uh, uh, biotech or, or pharma. We're primarily uh, healthcare services, medical devices, and medical technology. We've been around for about 20 years. We're investing out of our fifth fund, which we uh, closed last year at $200 million. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to flavor this in, in the comments. We're a little bit later stage for uh, in terms of venture investing and there is certainly an earlier stage venture ecosystem as well and I'll try to talk a little bit about both as we uh, discuss bridging from angel into venture. I'm Brian Beeler. I've been with Queen City Angels since about 2007. Uh, this is my entrepreneur camouflage that I've already been harassed uh, by several of you people. Uh, you know, when you tech, talk to these tech guys, you know, they, they like to talk to, you know, unshaven people. You know, the suit guys make them nervous. So. Uh, you know, my emphasis is really helping the web guys and, and, and younger guys go through this. I had a successful exit in an uh, online publishing company, so I can relate well to a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs that we see. I haven't had as much time lately, so I'm in a transitional state of, of uh, working in another company but still spending time with uh, QCA companies uh, when I can and participating in events like this to, to uh, give another perspective. Okay, um, so we're going to spend, uh, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes uh, going through some uh, a short presentation and then uh, much of our time we'll leave open for questions. So. Uh, Want to be responsive to to what's in your mind. So we'll see if this is going to work. Maybe not. Oh, wrong way. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure where that slide came from, but we'll start here. <laughs> um, so primarily, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what are we looking for, what are, or what are angels in general looking for in in companies and deals, um, and um, what makes a deal investable uh, from our standpoint. The number one thing, and if you talk to to investors anywhere, uh, they'll typically tell you the most important thing about the deal is the management team. Um, it's it's clear that most companies or many companies. <coughs> don't end up where they think they're going. So if you look at the business plan today and you look at it at where they are three years from now, they're in a very different place. And, and most times the original idea is not perfect and needs to be molded. And having smart, motivated entrepreneurs who can think on their feet, be reactive, be smart, be um, uh, aware of the environment, really increases the chance of success substantial. So the number one thing we're looking for, strong management team. It doesn't have to be a complete management team. Um, it's usually better to have more than one. Uh, solo entrepreneurs, we, we fund. Um, but if you've got a business guy and a tech guy, probably better. Sometimes they'll come with a team of three. Uh, very, very dependent on the company and the circumstances, but that's uh, number one on the list. Another thing that we look for is what we call an unfair competitive advantage. 
Uh, we call it unfair because we, we don't want to be fair. We want to beat the competition. Um, this can be in the form of intellectual property of some kind. could be patents, could be uh, trade secret know-how. Uh, sometimes it's, it's what we would call first mover advantage. It's the first, first people into the space. Nobody else has had this idea. We're going to get out. We'll have a two-year lead on the competition, and we'll win. Um, but there's got to be something about it that makes it unique. Because, as Tony said, you know, we're not interested in, in the next you know, sandwich shop or pizza chain or, or, or daycare center. It's got to be something that is, has some uh, unique uh, attribute. We obviously want to have a large market for the goods or services that the company is going to be selling, uh, typically in the hundreds of millions at least. So if, if an entrepreneur comes and says, hey, I'm going to get 50% of this market and we're going to be at a $10 million sales rate, Probably not so interesting. Um, we're looking for a business that's scalable. And when we talk about scalable, we're talking about companies that, as their sales increase, their margins increase. Um, so it's a company that can become, not only become big, but in becoming big, can make even more money. Uh, a typical example would be a software company. Once you've developed the software and you've spent $5 million or whatever it is to to, to create the software. Selling one more copy is almost free, uh, but you can still get the same price. So um, businesses like that, or businesses that, that have um, very high margins and high sales volumes are much more interesting. Again, the, 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 a consulting business, for instance, not so interesting because in order to, to sell more, you gotta have more people, you, you, you're, you're still fighting that FaceTime thing. So. Not, not, uh, not our favorite. Um, and and the other, another aspect is how much capital are they going to need? How are they going to get it? What's the plan? Is it is it six rounds of annual investment and then go talk to Dan? Uh, is it as Tony's example? With a million dollars, we can make it. We can get it done, and and we can actually do it. So it, there's no right answer, but but there needs to be a plan. Uh, back to the team for a moment. Uh, in our interactions with the entrepreneur pre-investment, we get a very quick sense of, of how coachable they are. Are they listening? As we're giving feedback on their business plan, are they saying, oh, I, I hadn't thought of that, I'm going to incorporate that. Or are they saying, no, no, I thought about that, and, and it's, that's, that idea will never work. Or, uh, you know, you just get a, a very clear feeling from the entrepreneur early on as to whether they're going to be interested in hearing what you have to say or whether they're going to be resisting, resistant to, uh, to input. Again, as Tony pointed out, local geography is important to us. We want to be able to, to be with the company routinely. Um, you know, we'll drive to, to Columbus. I drive to Cleveland periodically to, to visit with companies. But, you know, we're not so interested in companies on the coast, for instance. We've done a few investments like that and typically haven't worked out for whatever reason, but, but uh, we'd like to have them uh, local. And for our funds, uh, we are restricted to invest in Ohio companies. So that's another, another reason to stay local. Uh, we'd like an industry that we're familiar with, someone on our team uh, is familiar with. Now, with 50 members in our group, good chance of somebody's familiar with, with this space. Uh, and again, because we're investing primarily in a, in a few kinds of uh, types of companies, medical devices, software, advanced materials, uh, we, we have familiarity with, with many industries that we're, we would be interested in, in working with. Reasonable terms, again, um, what's the pre-money, what, what's, uh, what's the preference, what are the, what are the terms of, of the investment that, and we'll talk about term sheets here later this morning, uh, those all have to line up. I mean, we've just had, uh, been in discussions with a company that um, we, we, we've stopped talking to as of yesterday because we couldn't, couldn't the, the very, the very simple outlines of terms. We couldn't agree. Well, why waste your time if you're, if you're going to, you know, do do a month of diligence and then, you know, can't come to terms. Why not figure that out early on? And and the final thing here is a clear exit opportunity. So how are we going to, how are we going to get our money back? Uh, we we want to know that if this company is successful, somebody's going to want to buy them. Uh, and again, for software companies, medical devices, that's, that's usually pretty clear, but 
we want to have some good idea about how do we get that. Um, a few red flags here, things that make us nervous very quickly. Uh, a request to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, often inexperienced entrepreneurs will come to us and say, my idea is so, so critical that, that you have to sign an agreement that you won't share this with anybody else. We all do that because um, we work on a, on a trust basis. We also know that as soon as that guy walks out the door, another guy's going to walk in with a very similar idea, and we don't want to be in a position of, of questionable conflict. So NDAs off the table. Um, we're looking for entrepreneurs who want to really work hard and build a business, and their reward will be at the end of the day when we get our reward. So uh, entrepreneurs coming in saying, hey, I've got an expensive lifestyle and I need a quarter million dollar salary out, out, of, out of the shoot. Probably not going to work. Um, we won't, occasionally we'll have, we'll, we'll see uh, um, the, uh, an offering memorandum that's been prepared by a lawyer and it says, you know, we're going to offer shares of common stock in our company for some price and it's all formalized. Not interested. We, we, we'll, we're preferred stock investors, investors. We have preferences that we expect. We have controls and, and uh, other terms that aren't met usually by common stock. Um, and it weren't, again, unrealistic valuation expectations. Um, occasionally we'll get a company that's been through the mill, has been out there for five years. They've raised six rounds of capital at various prices. They've got 700 people on their cap table. And, yeah, you know, all of a sudden it just gets overwhelming. and. and we're, we're much happier when somebody comes and says, well, you know, I've got six people who've invested so far and um, they're all on the same terms and they all bought common stock and, and okay, but that's, that's good, we like that. But we've, we've been down the path of deals where a complicated structure at the end of the day has undone the deal after months of diligence and work and it's it just not worth it. Um, occasionally we'll get uh, an entrepreneur who says, well, I'm, I'm going to build this company and I'm going to run it for the rest of my life. Probably not a good fit. Um, and, and again, uh, occasionally we'll have uh, issues about intellectual property. Are they potentially infringing on another company's uh, patent? Uh, is there a, is, we need to be sure that there's a clear, uh, clear room to operate for the company. Um, so here are a couple of other unfundable ideas uh, that uh, we haven't come across personally, but certainly uh, Gary Larson has. So uh, I think that's the, uh, oh, I guess I've got one more here. So valuations, we touched on that earlier. Just flat out, the valuations for approved revenue companies in this, in this area are typically in the one to two million range. There are exceptions, sometimes lower, sometimes higher, but that's usually what we see here. Um, and as Tony mentioned, on the coast, on the west coast particularly, valuations for pre-revenue pre companies can be higher and are sometimes much higher. And you know, we, we read about the bubble and, and uh, the frothy nature and, and some of that's going on now on the West Coast, but here it's a, it's a little more grounded. Um, so uh, usually when we do a preferred equity round, or always when we do a preferred equity round, we're pricing the deal, we're, we're, we're putting it out on paper. Uh, when we do convertible notes, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, uh, normally, we would just put a cap on the valuation. So when our money converts into equity, we know the maximum, it might be lower, but it won't be any higher than that. Um, and that's an important term for us. Um, I guess uh, that's me. We're, we're on to you, Dan, so I'll turn the clicker to you. <laughs> 